All right, greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. I'm very happy to be here with you. There has been a lot of uh, talk in the last uh, couple of weeks in the UFO field about the Davis Wilson notes. Those are, of course, the notes uh, written by Dr. Eric Davis uh, way back, uh, almost exactly 20 years ago, believe it or not. So it was October 16th, 2002, when he wrote. Uh, many, many pages of notes dealing with uh, his interview with retired Admiral uh, Thomas R. Wilson. <clears throat> There's been a lot of talk about this. I have talked about this uh, quite a lot over the years. And uh, in fact, I've talked about the, um, the fundamentals, I guess, of what went on with Admiral Wilson since 2007. Um, and I wasn't the first. So this has been a uh, part of the discussion for a long time, but the notes themselves leaked out in 2019. And that's when, of course, this became a huge, huge thing, uh, causing endless amounts of controversy. Uh, people like myself supporting their authenticity. I would add people like myself who know those notes are authentic uh, versus a number of individuals who uh, maintained uh, I don't know if they still do. I really can't keep up all the time, but certainly maintained pretty strenuously for years that these notes were fake, forgery, uh, movie script, uh, or total misunderstanding or whatever. Uh, and, and, and really the entire debate has, in my view, uh, really held up the UFO community from moving ahead on a, a theme and an issue that is of prime importance to the UFO community, and I will argue actually beyond the UFO community. So uh, there was a, a very, very excellent interview just done a week ago over at uh, the Project Unity channel by my friend and colleague Jay of Oak Shannon, uh, who figures into the notes. I've got a link to that below. I do encourage you to check that out. Jay did a fabulous job, as he always does, in interviewing people. He did a very fine job with Oak Shannon um, and just giving you know more confirmation to the authenticity of these notes as if they needed it. My opinion is they don't need any more, but it's why not? So what I want to do here is discuss a couple of different things. First, I'm going to give you a very quick brief review of the notes themselves. Uh, just to remind you, if you've forgotten any of the details, what's in there? We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but a little bit I think is useful. Uh, I'm also going to talk about my own uh, personal interaction with these notes um, and my comments about them over the years to, to a limited extent. Uh, I'm going to discuss some of the key uh, points of evidence in favor of the authenticity of these notes. And then mostly what I really want to talk about, what I think is, is, is missing from the conversation in our community, uh, are the implications of the notes themselves and why they are so important. So one thing I just want to show you here, this is my website uh, over at Richard Olin Members. Um, it's, you know, there's a there's a paywall behind a lot of a lot of the things there, but a lot of it's free content. A lot of it's free content. This is an article I did uh, back in June of 2019 when this whole thing came out. This is a very, very long uh, dive I did at the time. I've got a link to this below. Please do check this out. Um, this is a, an extended analysis of the Davis notes of his meeting with Thomas Wilson. You can see a lot of screenshots there. And I really go into it. There's, uh, for anyone who really wants to get up to speed, I would say go check this out. You can uh, access the 15 pages on this page of my site here, or there's a link where you can get them off the uh, Imgur site. I think that is still active. These are the, the uh, pages themselves here, you can see, and uh, okay, some related articles. So, so that's, um, let me take that off. Do check that out. There's a, a lot of information there. And uh, I'm going to show you in a moment, a, uh, the link to Giuliano Marinkovic's outstanding um, analysis into uh, the authenticity of those notes as well. Um, I'll get to that in just a short while. What I think I want to do right now is uh, talk a little bit. Uh, well, let's actually get into the notes. I think that's probably the best way to start. So I've got a whole, uh, here we go. These, This is uh, something I prepared um, 
and then tweaked for this presentation here for you. So as you can see, these notes were prepared by Dr. Davis on October 16, 2002. Now, Eric Davis, uh, just for those of you who are not quite aware, he is an absolutely brilliant scientist. He, for many years, was the chief science officer at Earth Tech. That is the company owned by Hal Puthoff. Uh, of course, is very famous, and uh, da Eric Davis for many years was his very, very close colleague. I have no doubt they're still very close friends to this day. Um, Eric Davis also has been an independent contractor for the um, Air Force Research Laboratory over at Edwards Air Force Base. He did a paper on teleportation for the Air Force Research Laboratory back in 2004, and I saw that uh, that was collected by Joe Merge, UFO Joe. Uh, another really excellent researcher on this uh, subject. Joe's put a lot of great stuff together over at his website, ufojoe.com, I think it is. Uh, and then Eric Davis was also a consultant uh, for the ATIP program. Uh, Hal Puthoff was always his boss. Hal Puthoff was a consultant. Davis was a consultant. So Eric Davis is deeply, has been deeply embedded in the UFO subject for a very long time. Of course, he was one of the chief scientists analyzing the Skinwalker Ranch um, events back in the 1990s. So he's about as smart a person as we could ever hope for in this world and very, very knowledgeable um, about the subject. So I just want to show, uh, and of course, uh, Thomas Wilson um, obviously was head of the um, intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the capacity of defense, uh, head of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, Thomas Wilson back in uh, 1997, of course, met with Stephen Greer, Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, uh, command, Navy Commander Will Miller, um, along with his boss, General Pat Hughes, and a few other people. And, and there, Dr. Greer primarily led this uh, presentation talking about black budget, uh, special access programs, dealing with this subject of alien technology that was being held essentially by rogue operations and bringing it to Admiral Wilson's attention. And these notes uh, are essentially a description of Wilson's failed attempt to gain access to that program. He discovered it existed and was denied access. So uh, I'm just going to give you a quick little recap of it. Uh, they're fascinating notes. They're, they're uh, like there's a lot of detail in here, and a lot that uh, gives us leads and clues as to how the nature of this secrecy in UFO special access program operates. Um, he's describing here the members of the meeting that uh, occurred in April, 1997. And you can see there's Edgar Mitchell, there's uh, General Pat Hughes, there's Stephen Greer and, and so forth. Uh, and then he mentions to Davis that after the meeting ended, he spent a couple of hours talking with Commander Will Miller about things like MJ-12, which was real, um, crash UFOs, Yes, absolutely. And even alien bodies and so forth. So this, um, actually, do they have alien bodies in here? Um, crash UFO, confirmed he called Miller. Okay, so they didn't discuss alien. Oh, yes, absolutely. Alien bodies is in the text as well, of course. So there you go. Uh, additionally, after the meeting, he says you know, he made calls, talked to people for 45 days to try to get to the bottom of this, uh, you know, is there is there a special access program dealing with alien technology or not? Um, he got advice from powerful people, including uh, the recently retired Secretary of Defense himself, William Perry, who is still alive. I think he is about 100 years old, if I'm not mistaken, um, as, as like where to look for these types of programs. Uh, Davis, uh, at some point throughout this, it can, keeps asking Wilson for like, which is the contractor that was involved in this and all of these other questions. And Wilson just keeps saying, core secret can't tell, core secret. And by core secret, that is something, as he explained, like the re revelation of that would result in a catastrophic uh, loss to the program and to national security. And it just must never under any circumstance be admitted. Uh, Wilson discovers the program or a program, he actually discovered several, uh, reaches the program manager, reaches the security officer, and the corporate attorney. They are not happy 
that he has reached them at all. They're like, who are you? How did you find us? Uh, he demands to be briefed. He said, look, I'm J2. I'm with the Joint Chiefs. That means I'm, I'm you know, deputy head of intelligence. And it, this is within my purview. And it is your oversight. It is your mistake by not having me engage and involved in overseeing this program. Uh, their, their attitude is, well, we'll get back to you. We'll think about this and we'll let you know what we think. They do set up a personal meeting with him. He flies out to Nevada to talk with them. Uh, they tell him, yes, this is a reverse engineering program. And, you know, I don't know if he was playing dumb or pretending not to know or whatever, because he goes out there specifically because it's he's told it's ET UFO related, but he's saying reverse engineering. We're talking Soviet, Chinese, uh, you know, something recovered in the past. Soviet, they're like, no, it's not Soviet. It's not Chinese. Uh, 1997, honestly, how could it be Chinese? You really just have to wonder. But in any case, um, what they said is there's an intact craft. We have an intact craft that we think can fly. And then, of course, the line that uh, is the most famous of this of these notes, I would say, uh, it was technology that was not of this earth, not made by man, not by human hands. That's in italics at the bottom there. Uh, they told Wilson they were been trying to understand this technology, trying to exploit this technology. They said it's painfully slow progress. Uh, we're not getting much or any cooperation from the outside community. It's too much uh, secrecy is too intense. Uh, the number of people involved, anywhere from 400 to 800 people involved, and you have to consider for a program of this level of importance, that's not really as much as you probably would want, but it's the way it was the reality, according to what they said to him. So the bottom line is that uh, Wilson demanded to be let in. They said, nope, you're not coming in. Uh, why are you not letting me in? Well, we don't really want to tell you. We don't need to tell you. So we're not giving you the criteria. He complains to them that their attitude is, oh, fine, whatever you need to do. We're not really, we're not really too worried about it, apparently. Uh, and he goes back to D.C. to complain to his higher ups, and he is threatened with his career. Uh, he is told, in no uncertain terms, you are going to drop this matter, and if you do not drop the matter, you're going to take an early retirement and lose a couple of stars along the way. Now, um, a very quick recap of, of what these notes tell us. Uh, I'm going to come back to some uh, broader implications, but just, you know, specifically speaking. So what I would say is you got a probable billion dollar UFO reverse engineering program, programs really multiple, managed by corporate contractors hiding behind sub programs um, of other legitimate special access programs. One of the things that you find in these notes is that uh, the, the programs were essentially buried within other programs and it would be very, very, very easy to miss them. Um, they use false descriptions in the directory made available to members of what's known as the Special Access Program Oversight Committee, uh, known as SAPOC. Uh, I believe that's illegal. I've been told that's illegal. Sounds like it should be illegal. Before their encounter with Admiral Wilson, they told him that they had already almost been exposed, and they cut a deal with the leadership team of the uh, senior review group of SAPOC so that they continue, so that they could continue their secrecy, their deep secrecy, their illegal secrecy. Uh, the auditor, the, there was a Pentagon auditor who nearly found, who did find them out, and they had to bring him into the program simply to shut him up and to make sure that um, this person would not talk. Uh, also, they were able to make the senior review group to do their bidding. This is what I would say. Instead of praising Wilson for discovering the existence of, of contractors that were not reporting honestly to them. Instead, he was threatened with a denial of promotion. Uh, he was threatened with a reduction of rank and loss of his retirement pension. That's pretty severe threats. And um, this is my own opinion. Uh, I can't say that the notes absolutely say this, but this is what I believe is also going on here, which is that they um, and I'm talking about the contractors, probably Lockheed. Uh, I think that's where the betting money is, but w whatever the contractor was, that they gave disinformation to Wilson themselves. Uh, 
and again, this is my opinion, promoting the idea which they knew or maybe thought could spread that there had been no success, uh, successful reverse engineering of UFO tech and that alien abductions uh, were not real. And that didn't come from the corporate people. That came to Wilson from one of his supervisors at the Pentagon. Uh, in any case, uh, that's a, a quick, a real bare bones overview of those notes. Now, um, it's not difficult to see why they would be of prime importance and why they are, in fact, of prime importance um, due to what they say. Now, I was, I have said this many, many times, I was shown uh, several pages of those notes way back in 2006. Uh, that's 16, 16 years ago, good grief. And in fact, I began talking about them almost immediately. I did not ever talk about the notes themselves. I was very careful about this. I talked about the information that had come to me about the aftermath of Wilson's meeting with uh, Dr. Greer and Edgar Mitchell. And I talked about that quite a bit. In fact, let me pull up uh, Giuliano's um, uh, article first. Let me just uh, get to that. I need one moment. Let's see. Share this screen. And we're going to go to his. Here we go over at uh, Omni Talk Radio Network. Now, this is uh, just an outstanding, I have a link for this. Juliana Marinkovic is, has done some of the most outstanding collection of data on this subject. In fact, really, no one has done a better job than him on this. Uh, what he's done is collected just about every bit of testimony over the years, many, many uh, years preceding 2019, uh, supporting the authenticity of these notes, including um, many early statements of uh, Stephen Greer back in 2001, Edgar Mitchell, a uh, lot of early statements by Greer back in those years. And then starting around uh, 2007, uh, more statements. Oh yeah, Greer, Greer's book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, discussed this at, uh, in 2006. Uh, that's when Wilson's name really came out with this, I think. Well, not, that might not even be the first time, I think. Um, Edgar Mitchell and myself, uh, both in 2007, began talking about this a lot. Um, you know, and at the end of 2006, and I've spoken about this quite a bit, I uh, I phoned Admiral Wilson myself. Here's an early uh, lecture. I don't know how they found this. Uh, this is a uh, I think this is a MUFON uh, lecture I gave back in 2007 where I discussed it. Uh, they, he's got a screenshot of another ex-conference I did in 2007 as well. You can see my slide here. There's Admiral Wilson. Uh, way back in 2007, I'm talking all about this meeting at that time. And Giuliano found a lot of these. Uh, the One of the things is an interview I gave for the Paracast. I don't know if he's got that one linked here. Um, yes, he does. July 1st, 2007 where I'm talking with the host of the Paracast, Gene Steinberg. And uh, let me just, uh, I don't need to share this anymore. And at, right before one of the breaks, uh, I rather slyly <laughs> almost quoted the, the notes at um, specifically. I, I said, yes, uh, we were in possession of uh, technology not made, by, not made by human hands, not made by man. Uh, the audio quality is poor. But you can find this. I, I challenge you, go look for it. It's out there. Uh, and you can definitely hear me saying that right before the break. So, uh, you know, for anyone who just doubts that, who claimed that the notes were uh, somehow made up, I'm like, look, these notes have been out for a long, long time and they were held very, very closely. And of course, as we all, we all know, there's no question about this. We've had uh, extensive testimony from James Rigney. Uh, who I interviewed and uh, put the results of that interview on my YouTube channel several years ago. Uh, many people have talked about this, that these notes came from the estate of Dr. Edgar Mitchell. I'm going to show you a quote in a moment by uh, Eric Davis himself, who stated it explicitly that they came from Ed Mitchell's estate. We all know that. And here's how the whole thing went. When, uh, when the, the meeting that Stephen Greer had with Wilson ended, Wilson goes on his uh, wild goose chase, we could say, to look for these. This program is denied access. 
And what we know is that in the aftermath of that, he spoke to Commander Will Miller because they were close. They had a, they were Navy colleagues. They had a relationship. And he told Miller he had been denied, denied access. Miller was close enough with Greer and Mitchell. So he told Stephen Greer. This is how Greer obviously learned about the results of that. And he told Edgar Mitchell. Now, Edgar Mitchell was very much in uh, uh, very tight with what we can call the, the Bigelow group, the NIDS group uh, around big, billionaire Robert Bigelow. So uh, that's Eric Davis. That's Dr. Hal Puthoff. That's Dr. Kit Green. Uh, that's Dr. Colm Kelleher. Um, and, you know, along with Edgar Mitchell and a number of other people, these individuals all spoke all the time with each other. Uh, it's just, you know, they're colleagues. They, they would do this. And so the information came out to that group early, early enough that they became, they clearly became interested in learning more about this directly from Wilson himself. And, um, and then one of the key things that happened here is, uh, and this was just really uh, elucidated a bit, in uh, Jay of Project Unity's recent interview with Oak Shannon. Uh, in the notes, you, you find that Oak Shannon was the go-between, uh, Davis and Wilson, and helped to give Wilson the, the bona fides of Davis to uh, let Admiral Wilson know that Eric Davis was a safe and responsible person for him to talk to. And, uh, and in fact, when, when Jay asked Oak Shannon these very questions, did you know Thomas Wilson? Did you know Eric Davis? It's yes and yes, of course, I know them both very well. And um, there were other uh, bits of uh, arcane information that were in the notes about Oak Shannon that were absolutely true, as Shannon confirmed. The fact that he'd had recent heart issues at that time uh, was in the notes and Shannon said, yes, I, I certainly did. Uh, the fact that he was difficult to get hold of. I mean, simple little things like that. He said, oh, yes, that was very difficult to get hold of, and on and on. Um, so, yes, I think, you know, Shannon just gave yet more uh, clear confirmation that these notes are indeed the real deal. So what ended up happening is that Davis uh, goes out. Oh, the other thing that Shannon uh, was asked by Jay, and this is actually a really interesting little tidbit. Uh, Jay said, so did they ask you in 2000 or 2001 to uh, connect uh, Wilson to Davis? Or did you, um, did you ask Wilson in 2000 or 2001? Uh, did you talk to him about Davis? And uh, it was in 1999 that um, Wilson I think it was Wilson who asked him about Davis, or I, I'm trying to remember the details. But but Shannon spoke with Wilson about Eric Davis as early as 1999. I thought that was actually very interesting, and that just shows this group, the, the Bigelow group, was moving probably close to immediately to try to get a meeting or some kind of confirmation about this or inside information from Admiral Wilson himself. It's fascinating. So um, anyway, I, I talked about uh, these this meeting. I was shown those notes uh, in 2006. Uh, I wasn't given a whole lot of information. I was uh, shown them, and it was in an environment in which uh, I, I couldn't take a photograph of them. I, I couldn't write notes down. I was asked not to do any of that. Uh, I was only shown a couple of pages, including the key page where Davis uh, mentions, you know, not made of this earth, not made by human hands, not made by man. Um, so that obviously stayed with me. And, um, and then I talked about this, um, over a number of, uh, lectures and interviews and so forth over the next few years, well into 2010, maybe 2011. And then, um, I thought, all right, well, I've talked about this enough. I'm going to move on. Again, I did not state that I saw the notes themselves uh, because I essentially promised that I would not do that. But I did talk about my knowledge of some of the aftermath of this meeting. And that was that. Uh, in December of 2018, 
um, I was doing a spot on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, and uh, Jimmy asked me at that time, was there anything that I had ever encountered in my career that was so powerful and I, I never really talked a lot about? And it was at that point um, that I said, well, actually, not only have I, did I talk about the Wilson uh, affair, but I actually read notes about it, and I, and I made that statement there. I was in December 2018. Little did I know that by that time, the notes were just beginning to circulate very quietly on Imgur and that Grant Cameron uh, had already seen them and he himself, Grant, I spoke with Grant quite a bit about this, was wondering what was he going to do with this knowledge of these notes? Because again, all of this came out in the aftermath of the death of Dr. Mitchell and the fact that some of his personal papers were fortunately salvaged from destruction um, um, in his estate. This was actually very likely, this could have easily happened and they were preserved. Um, in April of 2019, someone, and I still do not know who this person was, uh, sent me through a Proton account, nothing other than the Imgur page link uh, of those 15 pages. And I left my own devices. I probably would never have seen that email. My wife, Tracy, found it. She was uh, helping me out, found the email. She says, what's this? And sure enough, when I clicked that and reviewed it, I was, uh, I almost fell off my seat. Um, I talked with Grant about this uh, shortly after that. And, um, you know, our feeling at the time, this is now we're in April and May of 2019. The notes themselves leaked out at the beginning of June of that year. Uh, neither of us wanted to be the ones to reveal these notes. We, I didn't want to be the one, and he did not want to be the one. I didn't because I felt a sense of obligation to the individual who showed me those notes to begin with, and I was, A, never going to reveal his identity. I still haven't. Some smart people are maybe able to figure it out, and, but I'm not going to confirm or deny it. They can do what they want. Some smart people I think have, but that's up to them. But the fact is I'm never going to give up that information um, unless I have permission to do so. Or unless that person's no longer with us, that's probably the other thing. But um, in any case, I wasn't going to give it up. And, um, and Grant had his reasons, he didn't want to either. And Grant said to me, well, now you're in the box I'm in. And indeed, that was how I felt. And I'll just state here, my attitude then and has always remained like I, I said to myself, I'll wait for a short period of time. And I didn't really have a, a hard deadline, but I said to myself, if these notes are not in the public domain within a you know certain period of time, I will just bite the bullet and I will release them myself. I made that decision, but uh, I didn't have to. Uh, by early June, someone was circulating them in a in a private email thread that was going out to a lot of people. And at that point, I said, uh, essentially, the hell with it. I'm going, I'm going to talk about it. And so I uh, created a YouTube video that I think was probably the first significant amount of publicity that those notes did receive by the world. So I kind of stepped right right into it in the beginning. Um, as as you all probably know, if you followed this, Admiral Wilson issued a denial, not the first time. He issued a denial to me back in 2006. He gave another denial to a journalist, Billy Cox, in 2008, and then gave another denial uh, when this came out in 2019, which, of course, he has to do. This is the thing. Clearly, this this subject that Admiral Thomas Wilson, in his very impressive career within the United States military, in the Navy, uh, in the Joint Chiefs and in the DIA, was obviously, he was exposed to a tremendous amount of very sensitive and important classified information. And yet it is entirely possible that this subject right here, the, the reality of alien technology being held by corporate contractors that denied him access to that. That may very well be the single most sensitive piece of information that he was exposed to in his career. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe there's something more than that, but I, it's hard for me to imagine 
What could be more significant than this? So, you know, as someone in the classified world with security clearances, how in God's name could he ever be expected to acknowledge that this was the case? When I called him back at the end of 2006, I knew full well that he was never going to acknowledge this. That didn't stop me from trying to reach him because I wanted to see what his reaction would be. And his reaction, by the way, was he became very upset and ended the phone call rather abruptly once he discovered what I was asking him about. I don't blame him at all. And Admiral Wilson, if you are ever listening to this, uh, I hope that you understand I have never um, uh, you know, thought that anything that you did was was anything other than what you felt you had to do. And, and some people may disagree with that, but that's his, uh, his position, and um, I respect that. So he issued his denials, which he had to do. And yet, you know, here's the thing. You have certain journalists and researchers in the UFO field who just took his denial at face value as a way to deny the authenticity of the notes themselves. And, and this is where you just have to shake your head, you know, and then you hear the theories. Well, it's fan fiction. It's a script. It's, but Davis met with an imposter. He actually didn't meet with Wilson. Like, you know, where do you get this from? Again, I will encourage all of you to go to uh, Giuliano's page that I, I showed you earlier. We got a link for it. And just go through the evidence on this. There's just an enormous amount of it. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about some of the other... Um, bits of authentication here about this. Um, let me mention Eric Davis here first. I've got uh, Davis, of course, uh, gave a very interesting interview with Stephen Greenstreet over at the the uh, the website, the, the, base, the basement vault, uh, the basement office, excuse me. This is from November 2019. They, they put this up, they pulled it, but they, we've got the transcript of this. So Greenstreet just says, let me bring up uh, the Wilson transcript. And Davis says, I can't discuss that. You can't discuss? Davis, I'm not at liberty to discuss it. Green Street, because you're all over it. And Davis says, oh, I know. Yeah. They were leaked out of Ed Mitchell's estate. So there's nothing I, and there's nothing I can say about it. Green Street's, I mean, can you speak to the veracity of them? And Davis says, no, I can't. I can't address that at all. I won't answer any questions on the Admiral Wilson notes. But he did state they leaked out of Edgar Mitchell's estate, which um, thank you for that, Dr. Davis. Appreciate it. And, you know, he's he's in a difficult position as well. I think everyone who has followed this understands this. He can't. It's even though these are he was not personally involved in that special access program. Wilson was not personally involved in the special access program, but it doesn't matter. They are in the classified world. They are, they have security clearances. And, you know, as Davis said elsewhere in that interview with uh, Green Street, excuse me, um, he said, uh, you know, that there are formal rules and informal rules of the road. He said, in other words, if you have a security clearance, you don't go talking about sensitive subjects, even if it's not explicitly stated one way or the other. This is just how it's done. Because if you were to start doing that uh, over and over, like, you every, you lose people lose trust in you. So um, that's just the way it is. So let me pull up uh, this statement by Dr. Mitchell. This is, of course, a number of you, I think, are probably familiar with this. Edgar Mitchell was on Larry King on uh, CNN way back in 2008 and uh, with Bill Nye, who just really cringily embarrassed himself on that. But Edgar Mitchell at one point talked about uh, indirectly, he did not mention Admiral Wilson by name, but he absolutely talked about this meeting. And I'll just read this part here. Uh, he says, well, I eventually went to the Pentagon and asked for a meeting with the Intelligence Committee of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That, of course, is what Wilson was running, uh, which I got with another Navy officer. That's Commander Will Miller, uh, who had many other similar experiences. And we told our story. And this gentleman, a vice admiral, that is Admiral Wilson, said to us, well, I don't know about that, but I'm going to find out and called a few weeks later and said he had found the source of the black budget funding for this project and that he was going to subsequently investigate because if it was the real, 
if it was real, he should know about it. As a matter of fact, he should be in charge. Those were his words. And in fact, this mirrors the notes by Davis very closely. Mitchell goes on. And so we did get calls from some time later and a report much later than that. I, I'm wondering if the report is simply Davis's notes uh, that he had, you know, in the report coming from Davis's meeting with Wilson, I, I have to assume that's what he was referring to here, um, that he had found the people responsible for the cover up and for the people who were in the know and were told, uh, and he was told, I'm sorry, Admiral, you do not have a need to know here. And so goodbye. And, um, that's that. So that's Mitchell saying that back in 2008, long, long time ago. Um, there can be, oh, by the way, a big thanks to uh, Joe Mergia and Juliana Marinkovic for getting a lot of that information together. Uh, it made it a lot easier for all of the rest of us interested in this to uh, cobble together all the information that we need. Uh, Juliana did a huge amount of work, and Joe Mergia also did a, a lot of work in publicizing it. A um, number of other folks as well. Danny Silva uh, has done great work on this over at his website and um uh james ian Doley over on his youtube channel um engaging the phenomenon and uh jay over at project unity all of them have done some really good work on this so um so that's that and so we've talked about davis's statement talked about mitchell's statement and then just you know um, I mentioned Oak Shannon a little while ago, his confirmation. George Knapp, the journalist who's been very, very close to all of those people in the Bigelow group. I mean, they're all, they all, George Knapp has been very close with them for many years. He has also said, uh, he's careful the way he does it. He has to be. I think he wants to be careful. Uh, what was his words? He says, I'm fairly certain <laughs> uh, that the leak is an accurate representation of, of the 2002 meeting, that the notes represent the meeting, that it's, that they're true. And in fact, he clearly knows, but we'll just leave it at that. Um, and he gave, he later gave a, a longer statement on that to Joe Mergia over at ufojoe.com. Uh, Gary Nolan, who was recently interviewed by um, uh, Ross Coltart. Sorry, Ross. A great interview that Ross did with Gary Nolan, where he also gave further support to the authenticity of that entire reality and, and the crash retrieval uh, phenomenon in general. Uh, and then Oak Shannon. So I think, you know, we're at a point here where the amount of support for the authenticity of these notes is no longer like there, there should be no need to go over this matter any further. We have wasted enough time arguing over, is this real or not? The notes are real. So I want to talk about the implications of these notes, because in my view, this is something that the UFO community does not discuss anywhere nearly enough. And uh, I think, you know, there's a really unfortunate tendency among many UFO researchers to just to get stuck in the weeds here and to fail to step back and see the big picture clearly enough. So that's what we're going to do here. Uh, oh, we don't need to look at that. Sorry, that's the wrong uh, link. <laughs> Let's go to this one here. Some of the implications of these notes. Simple one, an obvious one, but let us not forget, aliens are real and they are here. That is a key implication of those notes, as if we needed to know that, but let's just put that out there. Two, we have recovered some of their technology, including an intact saucer. Three, the technology is far beyond our knowledge and capabilities. Four, private military contractors, we'll say plural, um, even though in the notes it's one specific, but I think we can say plural, private military contractors possess our studying and are attempting to replicate this technology. Five, these contractors have exceptional levels of protection for their work uh, provided by the United States government. Six, they are immune from all types of inquiry, including from the highest level intelligence officials. Seven, we don't have a clear idea of who is in charge of these programs. 
there must be one person with the most authority, and it is clearly not the U.S. president. And I would like to ask, who is it? Now you can argue, oh no, let's try it. Just you know, plain as day within the DOD, within the SAPOC and the Special Access Program structure. But um, I think when you really review these notes, it is not clear at all who is actually running this. Uh, it, it, certainly, the United States president, not then and not now, could could possibly be on top of this. So we we are obligated to ask who is actually the not just the legal authority, but the practical governing authority over this program and these programs. Eight, the special access programs connected uh, to this program, that's kind of awkwardly worded there, sorry, are effectively buried within the DOD. And uh, I'll just add here, I've also been told privately that it's similarly, there are similar uh, structures within the CIA and the Department of Energy. That, in other words, where you have special access programs connected to the UFO ET phenomenon that are very effectively uh, ensconced within those agencies as well. Could be others as well, but we know DOD, we know DOE and uh, CIA. Uh, number nine, there is a significant wall of secrecy around this program. You've got government bureaucracy, you've got a compliant, basically complicit media establishment. Um, You've got the political community. Obviously, uh, they are they have no ability to break through this. And uh, let's not forget the supine and asleep academic community, which has been worse than useless in getting anything done in terms of investigating this. Uh, it's really been shocking. You know, we have a, a university system that you would think has a lot of smart people in it, good researchers. They haven't done anything. Uh, they they have obstructed. They have not helped. And in fact, their ignorance is just utterly overwhelming. 10, the program has, I'll say probably, but I think certainly exerted a significant amount of, uh, ex excuse me, extracted a significant amount of money for its research and development, for its engineering, for its manufacturing and, and the general operation. This, we don't know how much money is involved in this, but it's easy to see that this could be a lot of money when you, uh, connect that with the numerous reports we have had over the years of billions and indeed trillions of dollars of unaccounted for discrepancies within the Pentagon budget and within the United States government uh, in general. You really have to wonder how much of that has seeped out into a program like this. Now, I, I just uh, let me unshare the screen for a moment. Uh, we have often heard about trillions of dollars of missing money, and I just feel it would it's useful to uh, clarify this is not the same as saying that trillions of dollars have actually been removed from the system. It means that there's trillions of dollars of un, uh, uh, unbalanced expenditures. Uh, you know, in other words, one uh, accounting checkbook essentially not being balanced with another one and you've got expenditures that are not confirmed. There's a lot of duplicates within that trillion. Uh, trillions of dollars. Having said that, there is clearly a lot of money that has not been accounted for and that is missing. And there's a lot of room for an enormous uh, window through which a lot of money just goes flying through. And and it is reasonable to suspect that a, a portion of that has gone into this type of a program here. 11, someone is benefiting from this program. Yep, private contractors, no question about it. Free money, total security, protection, uh, leading uh, government people like like uh, Admiral Wilson himself, who after he'd retired from the DOD in 2002, goes off in private industry for this exact <laughs> dealing with space. And um, who I you know who knows what he's what he's up to now. But uh, there are people benefiting from this program, and. Um, it's worth our while to inquire about that. 12, maybe one of the more important implications. We live in a fictitious reality. Understand this, imposed by a small group for the purpose of concealing the truth about this alien presence. A fictitious reality. It's that strong. And, you know, People have always lived when, within illusions. We've, throughout our history, we've had 
many, many, many wrong ideas about all kinds of things. So you could say we've always lived, in a sense, within a fictitious reality of one sort or another. But this is an intentionally imposed fictitious reality orchestrated by a very small group of people for their... Now, you could argue the morality of this. You could say, hey, they're right to do so. This is a very deep, dark, scary situation and people could not handle the truth. That's their argument. But here's what I say. Um, a, I don't know that that's the case. B, we're smart enough in our world to know that we're being lied to. We're smart enough to know we're being lied to about this very important thing. And that folds into my final point here, which I think is a, makes this of prime importance. And I stay here that this fictitious reality that has been imposed upon us is especially disturbing because, understand this carefully, memorize this sentence. <laughs> because humanity is experiencing a top-down, centrally directed, global revolution that is transforming the very nature of our existence. Humanity is experiencing a top-down, centrally directed global revolution that is transforming the very nature of our existence. That's right. Uh, you know, I've talked about this a lot and I'm not gonna belabor that here right now. I'll come back to it because it's impossible not to. But when you're, you're in a situation all around you in which you see the world being transformed around you into a system of complete digital control over every single person in which the world that you grew up in is, that's gone. That world is not coming back. The world that I grew up in, the world you grew up in, it's gone. And it's a world of much less freedom, much less freedom of expression, much less freedom of economic opportunity and many, many other things that are much, much less. So um, in that world, you might think, well, what does that have to do with an alien presence? Here's what I say. The, al the unstated presence of aliens, who, by the way, are here, I think, in very large numbers. I've talked about this quite a bit elsewhere, here and elsewhere on my website and on this channel. That is a, such a huge portion of our reality that is unstated. It's a big, think of it as a huge, huge sphere that incorporates so much of our reality. And then there's another very big, big thing happening, which is this global revolution that I keep talking about. No one else is talking about it, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. This is a global revolution. And it is a fair question to ask, is there a relationship at all between those two things? Now you could argue that there isn't, but I have been suggesting for a while that there probably is a relationship uh, what is that relationship? Well, I don't have every answer here, but these are both hugely important things that are going on in our world right now. And it is at least worth asking if there's a relationship here. And by the way, what I would just say along those lines is, uh, while I do believe that uh, the alien or an, an alien presence has been in our world for a long time, even going back into our ancient past, yes, I do not believe that it has been on the scale and on the level and of the variety and of the intensity that it has been for the last century. I think these last 100 years are unique. Um, when you go through ancient UFO sightings and reports, which I have done quite a bit, I'm sure many of you have, you find they're very, they're different. Most of them are different than what we in the 20th and 21st centuries have experienced, certainly in terms of uh, type for the most part and definitely definitely in terms of sheer quantity. Um, so I think what happened, my governing theory, and I wrote about this a couple of years ago in my last book, The Alien Agendas, my current theory on this is simply that our technological development in the last century or two is the difference. It's what's gotten the interest of the local galactic community, let's say. Um, they realize that we're this close now to leaping into their world. And I think that's what's bringing them here. You know, 500 years ago, what could we do with aliens? What could they do with us? The answer is nothing really, but not any longer. We are now at a point where we are definitely getting the attention. We're exponentially, hyperbolically increasing our capabilities in the snap of a cosmic finger. And so that presence and the 
confluence of that with this global revolution, I think are an important consideration that we have to continually ask about, all right? What is their attitude toward this transformation? Do they uh, want to stop it and, and keep us uh, the way that we've been? Are, are they indifferent and just watching it as scientists or do they support it? Are they helping to promote it? Um, I don't think it's answers one or two. Um, they seem to have very much a kind of hive mind mentality, which is what exactly what our species is moving toward right now with this global revolution. We're turning into a big anthill, a big human hive mind. How do you not see it? Of course you see it. Uh, are they hands off? No, of course they're not hands off. They abduct people. They have craft hanging out over your home and your neighbor's home at two, three in the morning doing, what are they doing? Maybe they're abducting people there. They clearly are engaged in our world. Doesn't mean that they're evil necessarily, but it does mean that they don't have a hands-off attitude, that's for sure. And they are clandestine to the extreme. So that leaves option number three. Do they support this transformation? Well, I can't know, but I think it's a totally reasonable hypothesis that yes, they do support it. Now, um, the bottom line is that I would say the UFO community needs collectively to recognize the authenticity of Eric Davis's notes, first of all, to acknowledge the deep layers of secrecy regarding the matter of UFOs, and to spread that message far and wide. All of those things which are clearly stated explicitly or implicitly within those notes. Anyone at this late point who persists in trying to denigrate these notes, I think needs to be challenged and seriously questioned about their intransigence that, that flies in the face of an overwhelming preponderance of evidence. These people, look, a lot of them, they're, they're good people. They, I think many of them on this matter are just misguided to the extreme. They have probably inadvertently, let's just say, they have helped to hold back our field at a critical time in our history. We have wasted years because of pure obstinacy combined with uh, fear and uh, timidity by much of the rest of our community. That has to change. As the years go by, I find that the UFO community still gets very caught up in the, in the forests. We can't step back. We can't step back and see the whole big picture here. And we continue to ignore this big picture. We need to keep looking at the big picture. It's not easy. There are many parts to that picture. There are dead ends. There are false leads. Uh, uh, and there are hidden gems as well and understanding the relationships of each of the parts to others is very important, but it's also very difficult. It's very difficult, but that's what we need to do. We need to continually ask the important questions here. And also we have to be, that requires bravery, like it really does in the sense of not simply being content with saying the easy way out, which is, well, those are the basic facts and I'm not going to speculate. We don't know that there really are aliens here. And, you know, the, the U and UFO stands for, and I was like, oh my God, stop. No more of these utterly cringeworthy statements. <laughs> All right. There's something very important going on and we need to understand what it is and we need to talk about it. None of that is easy, which is why we need to dedicate ourselves to uncovering the truth. Well, that's all I got. <laughs> uh, I wanna thank everyone here for showing up. A uh, big welcome and a thanks to the chat family, as always, very grateful. Uh, and for the super chats and for your support. I could not do this without your support. If you like this video, if you like what I do, please subscribe, uh, like, subscribe, share. Uh, you know what to do. Check out my website over at richardolmembers.com as well. I have a lot going on there. And I'll see you again. Let's keep fighting the good fight. Later. <laughs>